Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal, and we do it one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate, that's me, and Benjamin de Campos in Los Angeles, California, who is a designer and believer. Ben? Hello. We do this by choosing a topic of interest, something that we think we need to know more about, or something that has been recommended to us. We spend a very small amount of time researching it. We have a discussion, and then we publish the notes. The notes are available for you to read along to right now on our site, eclecticist.co.uk. You can download the notes and also find information on upcoming shows and all of our previous shows. We think the benefit of doing this is to help foster a greater understanding of the world, uh, because we're all going to die soon. And let's face it, the only thing you can do of any value on this planet is to try and learn about your condition. Uh, the topic we're wrestling with this time round is North Korea. Maintain vigilance against the ever-looming threat of an American invasion. Let us hasten final victory through a revolutionary ideological offensive. Let us turn ours into a country of mushrooms by making mushroom cultivation scientific, intensive, and industrialized. As they say in that darkest of nations, North Korea. It's a minor miracle that a country can succeed in alienating itself from the world stage so completely, but the technologically impoverished denizens of retro-Soviet Democratic People's Republic of North Korea resolutely stand behind an electric fence of unending anti-Western propaganda. Or so it would seem. What do we think we know, and what do we actually know about the last communist nuclear power? We're not going to be talking about Bronsky Beat. So, North Korea, it's, uh, it's a funny old country. I didn't really know much about it at all. Um, I, I, what I thought I knew about it, I found out I didn't actually really know about it. And as bad as I thought it was, perhaps it isn't quite as bad as it actually is. What do you think? Really? Well, that sounds interesting. Well, why don't you talk about that? I'd be interested to know what you learned about it. Well, I suppose we should probably lay down a timeline. So North Korea, there is a far eastern peninsula uh, on the mainland next to Japan, and this is the Korean peninsula. It has always been there, but North Korea and South Korea as countries and states, I suppose, have not always been there. They're actually really quite new, these two countries. They've been around since about... 1948. Um, so they, they both started off as part of the Japanese Empire. And I think they were the Japanese Empire since the very beginning of the 20th century. And before then, uh, they were, I suppose you could say, their own countries. But they had been invaded many times and uh, they, had, they were quite tribal and, you know, throughout the, uh, the millennia going back. But Japan lost World War II, which is perhaps news for somebody out there. But uh, they lost, and they lost their imperial control of the entire peninsula. And then the Allied forces just carved it up and tried to build individual states. So in 1948, North and South Korea were created. So at that point, the whole peninsula was quite similar in that it had a, the sort of same level of technological sophistication, the same sort of military level, um, you know, very underdeveloped, almost third worldy sort of uh, state of affairs. In 1949, uh, all the American, major American occupying forces left. Uh, and then quite soon after that, in 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea. Uh, they were belligerent for a while, but they actually then just, you know, pushed forces uh, across the the border, which is known as the 38th Parallel, uh, which was um, implemented, I believe, by the UN and the Allied forces. There, there's the Korean Armistice Agreement, which was signed in 1953. And then in 1991, you know, way, way, way after that, um, both North and South Korea signed the, um, they, they joined the UN, 
Uh, and then in 2003, North Korea dropped out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which it was a signatory up until that point. And then 2004, the uh, Team America World Police film came out by the chaps who made South Park. And in 2014, a terrible film, or what would seem to be a terrible film, The Interview, uh, was released. Awful. I, I couldn't even get past 10 minutes of that movie, so I failed on that score. That's effectively the entire exhaustive timeline of North Korea. So the Korean War. We can, we can just accept that uh, Japan lost its imperial control because it had uh, lots of things to worry about um, at the end of the war in 1945. Uh, but then North Korea very much sided, um, philosophically, economically, and socioeconomically with the communist ideal. So the leaders were heavily influenced and in cahoots with the Russian government and also the Chinese government, two big communist bloc states. South Korea, on the other hand, allied itself with the allies from World War too. So there's a heavy American influence and also a, a Japanese influence from the, um, the, the rebuilding. So we had two completely diametrically opposed systems of philosophical politics happening in both of these new countries. Uh, but then 1950 came around after all the Americans left and war. Huh. What is it good for? What do we know about that war? Um, obviously, this is um, sort of the Cold War that's starting to come into view here, where you have obviously communist Russia. Uh, China had just recently become communist. Um, and as you say, the North Koreans had communist leanings. And so Korea as a peninsula was sort of cut in the middle of this whole thing. And I think we can kind of talk about the communism versus capitalism trope from where we are now and say that capitalism is a better thing. Well, when the North Koreans invaded South Korea, I mean, it was a, it was a real push for land. You know, the North Koreans really wanted to push the South Koreans off the peninsula entirely and then, you know, take it over and create its communist state. So the idea was certainly a land grab. Uh, you know, they, they, they broke over the, the armistice agreed border and, uh, you know, they had an invasion force, which was heavily armed by the Chinese and the Russians. So they had a formidable, um, military. The Americans got involved and in, you know, they, they had a huge military machine, which they contributed to the war. And also the British were involved uh, to try and help the South Koreans fend off this encroachment. And I think ultimately, by the end of the war, it was North Korea that lost out in terms of actual square miles. And they were pushed back um, behind their borders. And uh, then things got very cold and frosty as far as the, uh, the Cold War was concerned. So then, you know, no more trade, no more talks. It was a, a terrible situation. Yeah, but it was it, it was a, a war of ideology, really. Um, and the reason why I say about communism just in the world has failed, and I think people can kind of look at their history books and see why that happened, and also see, I don't know, the it's a hard thing to kind of measure, but I think it's probably not controversial to say that communism was pretty miserable for regular people, for normal people. And so... The Americans, who were obviously fighting the American war for freedom <laughs> and, you know, capitalism and all those sorts of words, I can sort of safely say that they were on the right side, wouldn't you? Well, they're certainly on the winning side. Ah, so, um, okay. Communism in the Soviet Union completely collapsed, and uh, communism in China, certainly after the Tiananmen Square massacre, uh, they had to... Com they they had to completely uh, re-figure how they were going to persist in their communist government. 
and central control and all the rest of it. So they they kind of almost compromised a little bit in China with this sort of state controlled capitalistic outlook, which has massively helped their economy hugely. So they've slightly branched away from purely collective communism, uh, and they have a, a strange hybrid, uh, which you could argue they're benefiting from now. But uh, you could also consider that to be a small victory for capitalism, mm. philosophically speaking. Yes. So for sure, it was a war of ideas. It was a war. I mean, it, the the benefit of the war for North Korea would have been a you know increased land mass uh, in terms of resources because you know they needed resources. They they were quite self contained at the time, and uh, they didn't want to be completely reliant on their military allies uh, so they needed the land so certainly land was important but uh from the from the the south side from the western perspective it's uh, a fight against the specter of communism you know they needed to the americans and their friends certainly believed that communism was evil and they could point at lots of other regimes around the world where people were generally suffering because of it um, and then after the war, I mean, obviously we can look at that peninsula now and there are the famous satellite photographs where you see all of the electric light bulbs switched on in South Korea and just total darkness uh, north of the border uh, because the North Koreans don't participate in any major trade agreements with anybody in the world. So they're unable to import um, fuel stuffs, for instance, where South Korea imports a huge amount of energy, so they're able to keep their lights switched on at night. Um, that's racing it, forward a little bit. I mean, it, it is, but this is this is the this, you know this is communism in action and what communism actually means. That's not quite the whole picture because um, North Korea was actually kind of doing okay until the fall of communism, until the wall came down, basically. Um, and then suddenly, without this major ally, then they started to suffer. So it was, it was sort of mid '80s, and I think after the wall came down, then they just became this isolated state that just whizzed off everyone. Which was one of the motivators for the land grab. They needed more resources. They didn't want to be completely dependent on their, uh, you know, the Soviet bloc uh, at all which isn't a good idea. They wanted self-sufficiency, but in order to be self-sufficient, you actually have to have resources. Yes, but the reason why I say about the Americans being on the right side, obviously we all just assume that if Americans are involved, then they are the imperialists and they are just by default you know, doing nefarious uh, activities. But I don't think they were. And um, it's also interesting to see to this day, the anti-American propaganda from North Korea, you know, and just, just how much they hate America and see them as these absolutely evil imperialists. And, you know, they call them American scumbags or whatever they say. The perpetual war. Korean war, the Cold War, all this kind of stuff. So, <laughs> and Cor Korean, uh, Korea, because of the very powerful ally, uh, North Korea, because of the very powerful ally, was actually doing okay. They're, I think they were kind of like neck and neck with South Korea. And obviously, there's a kind of um, a, a real competitive element there on the world stage between the, these two parts of the peninsula. But when communism collapsed in Russia, then North Korea, as we know it today, pretty much sort of emerged out of that and has descended into more of a pit of just horror and suffering and torture. And... Uh, it's. Um, I think Sam Harris calls it like a hostage crisis, where the, the the people are so impoverished on every level. It's essentially like they're being held hostage by their horrible dictatorship. Well, well, they certainly don't. The general population doesn't have very much freedom to leave. That's for sure. So they they are literally kept in the country uh, by electric fences, and nobody has uh, nobody has um, passports or, or, as I say, freedom to travel. No, they don't even have freedom to travel like within North Korea. <laughs> no, indeed, yeah, you're, it's really uh, zoned uh, North Korea. You know, there there are very few people, very few people living in the rural areas, which is most of um, most of uh, the country are able to travel to Pyongyang, for instance. I mean, that really is sort of like a uh, a show city. Yes, their showcase <laughs> almost, capital, <laughs> almost for the West. Uh, yeah, and few people have even visited it. Um, so I gather. But um, 
Yeah, it's interesting. You say electric fences. Uh, I read this book, Escape from Camp 14 by Blaine Hardin. And it's about um, a political prisoner in North Korea who escapes to South Korea. So not only is he living in North Korea, but he's also in a political prisoner camp. So he's a prisoner in North Korea as well as just living in North Korea. But he manages to escape and he, he speaks of getting across all the electric fences and how he needed to crawl over the body of another escapee or, or would be escapees in order to avoid the electricity. Um, terrible, awful, harrowing story of this man's escape. But uh, it is his account of his escape. So I think factually, there's a lot of uh, dubious information in the book. And I think the the author, Blaine Harden, has actually admitted, uh, you know, s- subsequent discoveries have uh, invalidated some of the information in the book. So I thought that was quite interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Um, that's interesting. But yeah, electric fences for surely. Sure. Oh, I didn't know that there was electric fences. But there's a lot of there's a lot of South Korean propaganda against North Korea. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of lies about North Korea, and in both directions. Yeah, I think you probably yeah you're on pretty shaky ground there. I know that there is a bias to generally report more sensational sounding tidbits from the hermit kingdom but um i don't know (laughs) i think that's a bit of a strange place to go because uh i think there's a lot of truth in a lot of what we hear about the place yeah i'm not saying i'm not saying that there isn't a lot of truth but i think a lot a lot of the statements you know not not everything is holocaust denial kind of territory that you're sort of in no not at all not at all I'm, i'm simply saying that uh you know don't believe absolutely everything you hear about north korea you know Every, everything takes a little bit of investigation, you know, fact-checking and the rest of it. Maybe we should talk about why there are so many political prisoners in, in North Korea. You know, what is the deal with North Korea? What is North Korea actually like to, to live in? And it's interesting, you know, looking into this. You know, we see lots of parallels to, like, the worst kind of failed states of the 20th century. You know, all of this seems to happen inside of North Korea. You have a, a very dangerous, brutal... Um, corrupt theocracy without the religion in North Korea. You have this dynasty of the Kims. Yes, and just even j- just looking into their just looking into their own bi- biographies is just interesting, <laughs> and how they're revered. Probably the the finest example of cult of personality, I'd say, certainly within the twentieth century. Yeah, so there you know lots of mythology around the three Kims, Kim Il Sung. Um, he was known as the great leader. Uh, he died in 1994. He was 82 years old. And his uh, power naturally passed along to his son, Kim Jong-il, who I think most of us are probably most familiar with. Um, and he died in 2011. He was 70. And his power was conducted to his son, Kim Jong-un, who is the current um he, he's known as the great successor, and he's the current political incumbent. Uh, and he's quite a young man. I think he gained power when he's in his 20s, and uh, he's only 33 now. And, uh, you know, he is the overall grand ruler of the entire country, unelected, total dictatorial control of everything. Yeah, and I, I think that's also a great example of... Um of how North Korea rolls, because this guy, he's never spent a day in the military. And then he's, whatever his title is, it's something like Supreme General of North, I don't know what his title is, but it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. And because, you know, we live in the 21st century, you know, we're able to find out about the, the origins of uh, this little oik. I mean, he's not only father uh, following in his father's footsteps and grandfather's footsteps, he's introducing even more sort of barbaric and draconian guff. I mean, Obama is the, the commander-in-chief. I mean, he's, he's the chief commander of all the military power in the United States. Right. Can't imagine him running around with a machine gun. Mm, yeah, I guess. We have a culture of fear. And again, we've seen this in, in other sort of failed nations. <laughs> and, you know, you say... Idi Amin, Mugabe. I mean, I think of uh, African uh, failed states and uh, tyrannical dictatorships. I guess, but... I, I think this is quite similar to those. Something keeps different, though. I mean, because there is something definitely fascinating, maybe in a slightly ghoulish way, of just, like, watching, uh, like, North Korean content on YouTube. It's like, you know, very famously, there's the announcement of uh, the 2011 death of... Um, 
the second Kim. You had the newsreader who was just inconsolable with you know her her tears, and she was trying to read this story. And then it cuts to people on the street, and they all seem to be trying to outdo each other in grief, <laughs> like someone just going crazy. You know, I can't help but think that you know what, what's actually going on here. <laughs> How sincere is this? And that's a page straight out of 1984. I mean, you know, you're literally being watched all the time, and if there's any any clues to your ambivalence, uh, then you know that's it. You're you're going to room 101. Uh, Or in the case of North Korea, you go to a a political prisoners camp, of which there are many, and uh, and then they're they're totally full up. Okay, so I'm just so looking at this list in our on our show notes. So what would the government like you to think? Well, all information is channeled to the government, be it TV, radio, uh, newspapers. It's all state produced. So there is this list that was compiled, this sort of freedom of the press list. And uh, they were number 177 out of 178 countries. Um, it's also interesting to see what number 178 was. C- Central African Republic. <laughs> <It's>, uh, Eritrea. <laughs> so the people of North Korea are basically fed all, all of these lies and all, the, all this propaganda. And I've, I've heard various reports that like, th- they believe that they are a master race. Um, and they're actually incredibly racist. Which is interesting. That, that's in keeping with the fact that they have a 100% racial homogenation. Right. I mean, they're, they're you know, they're, there's no multiculturalism in North Korea. They're, there's one human type there, yes. and that is all. Well, there, there's, there's a couple of exceptions to that. There's one or two. Uh, Dennis Rodman. Is that the basketball player? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, but there was a documentary that I watched about um, a couple of uh, people who defected to North Korea. It's these four military guys that properly drank the Kool-Aid. It's a really strange documentary. You should watch it. I'll put it in the show notes if you haven't seen it. They were, I think it must have been during the Korean War, but that seems a little too early. Maybe it was not the Korean. Maybe it was after the war, but they were stationed in military bases in South Korea. But they went and defected. It's like four of them. They didn't do this together. So for whatever, you know, they were conscientious objectors or, or what, they disillusioned with the West. And so they went to North Korea uh, and assimilated, and they became actors that appeared in anti-American propaganda films. It's really, really interesting. It's, it's, it's an interesting documentary. It's a BBC documentary that actually went to North Korea and you know, filmed talking heads with these guys. And it's just interesting, like the, the main protagonist, how he doesn't sound like what you and I would think of as a Westerner. <laughs> you know, he's, he's drunk the Kool-Aid and he believes all of this stuff. And he seems quite culturally removed from um, us. Just the, the kind of things he talks about, how he talks about them. It, he, it's, he sounds like an alien. So the government feeds the people all sort of lies about um, their standing in the world uh, and how inferior other races are and all, all this terrible stuff. I think even if you rescued every single North Korean and tried to explain to them that their government is horribly corrupt and brutal and all of these bad things. They just wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. The lies are so deeply ingrained. I mean, I am talking about like the average North Korean. I mean, the the peasants as uh, North Korea's official website refers to them as, but the actual sort of the the heads of state, you know, the the high ranking officials, people like that, they actually know the truth, <laughs> but their lives are so cushy. Yeah, it's also relative. I mean, if you're living, you know, a country is a big place. And you're living in a country and you have no idea of the outside world. Well, then, you know, your reference points are set locally. Yes. So, you know, you really have no idea. So you adapt to, to whatever the current environment is. I mean, there are certain things that are, that are obvious um, if you are adversely affected uh, to to a great level, then you know it doesn't matter what's happening out, you know in the rest of the world or how other people lead their lives on the planet. If you're physically suffering, then there is a problem. Mm. You, know, you can never accept that as normal. Yes, you can accept it as normal suffering, or that suffering is normal, but but not that it is the right way to be. And you know, there's a, there's a fundamental understanding of how it is <laughs> to live yes. comfortably. So if you're physically being tortured, I mean, you know, you're being physically tortured. You're not smiling and thinking, you yeah, know, this is fantastic because it hurts. 
down that avenue, I was watching this little, uh, I've put this in the show notes, this little, um, little excerpt uh, on the United Nations website. It's the uh, little, it's a clip, the, the human rights in North Korea, excerpts from the public hearings of the Commission of Inquiry. Uh, this is testimony on human rights violations in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea given to the Commission. So this is people who were in these internment camps and things like that. And I was just listening to the, this this one little testimony that this uh, guy was given. This this young guy. He looked in his. He looked about eighteen or something. And he's from a family who he was actually born in one of these internment camps. And he was saying that he heard his mother and brother sort of almost maybe kind of talk about their plans to try and escape the prison camp. So he went and told the supervisor and believed that what he was doing was the right thing to do. This is Blaine Harden's book, Escape from Camp 14. Is this, is it, well, it, there's a whole bunch of different... That, that is well, his book. There's a whole yeah. bunch of different people. So he, he explains how he blamed his mother. You know, his mother was executed. Okay. Uh, well, let me finish this story. I don't think this is that guy. I mean, it's possible that you know, this really isn't a unique story in uh, North Korea. So he told his supervisor uh, that he, he he heard his mother and brother possibly maybe talking about fleeing. Um, mother and brother were promptly arrested and then publicly executed in front of this kid. And this kid thought he, he had done the right thing and felt good about it. I mean, that's how kind of twisted that his brain is. It's, it's just crazy. I mean, how, how could you possibly think that? I mean, what would happen to you to make you think something like that? Um, so, because he thought he did a good thing, he went to the supervisor and, and said, you know, can I have a reward, please? Um, and for that, he, he was then uh, taken and then, like, hung upside down for two days and then tortured for six months with hot coals on his back or something crazy like that. I mean, I, I find this actually unimaginable, that this has happened and is happening, that there are several of these internment camps dotted around North Korea, and there's some estimate that there's 200,000 such prisoners in North Korea. Yes, some truly diabolical tales that come out. You know, they might, they, these are stories that may well have just come out of Auschwitz. Yes. Uh, but this is happening now, and, uh, you know, for a much l- greater amount of time. <laughs> It's been decades and decades of this sort of suffering. So, 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 so has been reported. Um, I see. I wonder whether or not that someone could make a case that it's actually worse than uh, like Auschwitz. Um, maybe there is some little scintilla of of humanity in at least turning on showers to make it appear as though they weren't about to be murdered. Whereas in North Korea, it is straight up public mm. executions. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, it's hard to get your brain around this yeah. kind of uh, inhumanity as we would see it. Yes. Um, and uh, we, we, we are told that this is occurring. So you then, you know, you learn of these things and you hear these stories and you read these books and you think, well, what what is anybody doing about this? Is this going to continue forever? I mean, <laughs> what can the rest of the world do about it? Do we have... Other things to think about currently or, you know. Well, there's an interesting kind of way to come at this because I think in some ways this is kind of analog- analogous to um, the worst kind of uh, Islamic theocracies in the Middle East. But the difference with North Korea and, and those places was well, a lot, obviously a lot of differences. But one of the differences you, you notice is that people will condemn North Korea where they won't condemn the Islamic theocracies in quite the same way. It's like they can clearly recognize that the Kims are, um, you know, the worst kind of brutal dictators and all of this kind of stuff. But I think because there isn't actually, um, you know, a, a belief in the supernatural, although there is, <laughs> they, they are actually held as, as gods, uh, the Kims. But obviously, by the, the West doesn't see it that way. And I think um, somehow North Korea, people people talk about it being a really, really horrible place and um, we should do something about it. But, of course, they have nukes. Well, if we were buying their oil, we might think differently. That is true. But uh, they don't actually have any oil, so mm. therefore they, they only receive our scorn and not our petrodollars. But I think the nukes is quite a big deal, though. Yes, yeah, so they are evidently a nuclear superpower, 
Uh, they have nuclear weapons, uh, so it has been reported. And they have some sort of, you know, fairly rudimentary launch mechanisms. They are able to actually launch um, or, or send up heavy launch vehicles uh, into the atmosphere, which is which is more than, you know, we've seen from other uh, uh, um, suspected nuclear-capable nations. So they have some military might. They have an, an enormous standing army. I mean, it's pretty much their entire population. Yeah, I think it's maybe the largest in terms of ratio with civilians, or maybe the second largest, or something like that. So you know that that's a concern. Yeah, they they are a military dictatorship. I mean, <laughs> they, their their way of life is is very military oriented. Uh, all of their aphorisms and all of their um, uh, axioms are very much self sufficiency, defense of the realm. And uh, death to the West. And so we, we've heard those before from other nations. But what their actual uh, capabilities are in terms of uh, military aggression, uh, who knows? All we know is that the last time they tried anything, they were defeated. Although they they think they it was a success and they won. When what so, are you talking about? The Korean War. Oh right. The Korean War was a victory for the North Koreans. Well, you say that was the last time, but it seems like every couple of years they always pipe up with something. And and you hear, like, South Korean soldiers being killed on occasion. Yeah, they'll shoot at boats floating by, yeah. and uh, there's occasional rocket and missile tests. Yes, lots of acts of aggression, and it's strange that it doesn't seem to trigger conflict. I mean, you know, they're killing soldiers. Yeah, I don't know what that conflict would look like, though. But we let them off, that's the thing. It's very odd. I mean, they do launch, you know, there's stories every couple of years, as you say, of... Uh, you know, missiles landing in the Sea of Japan or, you know, some boats are being attacked in the East China Sea or something <laughs> like that goes on. Mm. Uh, and the Americans certainly have warships in the area. So, you know, the the Americans in the West generally are keeping tabs on North Korea. And obviously, you know, we, we, we see a lot of North Korea. We can just, just need to go to Google Maps mm. and you can see fairly recent um, photography of the entire country and the cities and all the rest of it. Yeah. So quite a lot is known about North Korea. We probably know more about North Korea than any North Korea. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. They don't have internet access. Um, you know, and the reason why they don't have internet access is to protect the West. Uh, uh, and, and the way they, <laughs> the way that works is that they believe, uh, if the North Korean people were to see the corruption and, um, uh, and the uh, the filth yeah. uh, of the West on the internet, then they would criticize the West, and that would hurt the West's feelings. So the North Korean government is actually protecting protecting the West from criticism from the North Korean people by blocking the internet. There's a factoid going around that half of the defectors had access to the internet, and that was somehow crucial in them realizing they need to get the hell out of there. Yes. Plus, as you said earlier, uh, people will know when they're suffering. And also, I mean, this goes back to another analogy with um, Nazi Germany, is yeah. if someone defects in North Korea, it's quite likely that there will be reparations to their the family that they leave behind that goes back like three generations or something crazy like that. And so, I think it was, was it last year that some really high up... Uh, official in the North Korean government was arrested and very quickly executed. Do you remember that? Was that, I think it was, it was uh, Kim Jong-un's uncle? Uncle, it's something like that. But he was very swiftly executed. And mm. very shortly after that, I believe that um, his family or, or some of his family were rounded up and then promptly arrested and sent to internment camps. Um, fairly distant family as well, because there's some chatter that... Um, some of them didn't even realize that they they were were related to him. Now again, perhaps this is part of this anti North Korean well, bias that uh, we were talking about earlier. But it's fairly believable, I think, um, and pretty darned scary that someone can be arrested and then quickly executed, and then that's that. Yeah, of course. I mean that that's that's one of the um, the perks of having a, a tyrannical dictatorship. Right. Uh, you can literally, you know, give anybody the bums rush and bundle them into a, a van and drive them off, and then subsequently uh, ex explain how much of a, a treasonous scoundrel they yes. were. Yes. Um. Yeah. So when I hear stories, these these terrible stories that you often hear and read about, 
I, I sort of back off and uh, have a look at what we actually know we know about North Korea. I mean, what do we actually know? So we, we know where it is. We know what the buildings look like because we can see them. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we can look at the people when we, when we see them. So, you know, whenever we see the people, we can have a look at them and see what they actually look like. And every time I see any kind of uh, video somebody has filmed when they've gone on a tour of Pyongyang or even, uh, you know, out of Pyongyang, when they've been able to capture video or photographs, uh, whether uh, knowingly or um, stealthily, the people look pretty healthy. I mean, I don't, I don't see a lot of severely unhealthy people. I don't see a lot of really old people. That's for mm. sure. But I don't see any visibly unhealthy people or people who are missing limbs or, you know, people who are walking as if they've been tortured. There are a lot of healthy looking people there, it would seem. Um, there are a lot of children who seem to be extremely talented and happy yes. looking. And there seem to be a lot of smiling faces and there seem to be theme parks and um, beaches and uh, other sorts of resorts, uh, which is where, where are you seeing? I this? mean, uh, just, you know, from the Internet. So lots of videos I've seen and lots of photographs I've seen, uh, lots of tourists. I mean, they, they do have tourism, you know, like 2000 people a year are allowed to have a holiday in North Korea. And but, sure, but they're really. shown a front. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're, they're shown what I'm sure North, the North Korean government wants you to see. But even so, you know, there are telltale signs of uh of how the general state of living is at least in Pyongyang. And you know, there are lots of interesting little bits of strangeness that I we in the West find, you know, completely bizarre. For instance, um we know that they have hardly any cars. They have they they're, they're self-sufficient in that they generate their own power and they have very little resources. They have very little oil or coal or, you know, any kind of natural fuel. And that's a real problem. I mean, you know, the, the rest of the world has the same problem, but the rest of the world trades. So, you know, everybody's importing energy all the time. Uh, but North Korea isn't. And yet they are able to function. They actually do have electricity. They do have power mm. stations. Uh, they do have cars, you know, just not very many. So it's amazing what they have achieved mm. considering how little they trade with anybody. It's, it's astonishing because the, the actual terrain is pretty harsh in North Korea. You know, there's real extremes. It gets insanely Siberian cold in the north and it's very undul, you know, it's a real undulating landscape. It's fabulous mountain ranges, uh, but very little arable land. So there's very little space to actually grow food. So it doesn't take much. To, to knock them into major um, famines and, you know, bouts of starvation and, you know, weather conditions can wipe out huge chunks of the population. And yet there still are um, reportedly millions of people living there. So you could look at it and say, you know, they're survivors. They have actually not imploded yet. Mm. But are, are we seeing a country that is heading towards inevitable? Is it inevitable that they will implode or... Something will happen where the government is literally erased and there's a revolution or there's some sort of mass killing. Or, I mean, are they, are they on the edge is my question. Or, or, or are they sustainable? Okay. Uh, there's a few things there I want to pick up. The thing about their electricity, uh, yeah, they're, they have their own power, but it's very well known that there's often power cuts. And clearly, it's not power as we know it. Because as you said, you see that, that satellite photograph of uh, the nighttime in the peninsula and you see... North, uh, South Korea just like lit up like a Christmas tree, and um, North Korea is just virtually black. Um, also, I just wouldn't be taken in by the photographs that you said you see of healthy North Koreans because you you, you know how tightly controlled all of that stuff is. You're just not allowed to take photographs of anything that they they don't want you to take photographs of, and it's very severe the punishment um, if you transgress any of that. Uh, so there's sort of very shaky hidden camera footage on a lot of these documentaries that show actually what the peasants look like, the people who aren't in their showcase capital. And they don't look that good. No, they look like they're starving. They look like they're starving. And plus also, starvation actually really is a thing in North Korea. And apparently it still happens. There was the arduous march, which they talk about. Sort of within North Korea, they have some pretty weird um, explanation of why the arduous march happened. But that's another story. So, photographs, I think the photographs that you see of North Koreans are probably photographs that they don't mind you seeing. And also, there are actually 
numbers about um, life expectancy and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know where they get this stuff from, but the life expectancy of of a North Korean is 69.8 years. I don't know what that takes into account of. That doesn't sound too bad, considering... Yeah, I don't know. Again, I mean, where on earth do they get those Exactly. From? Where uh, do they get that from? But again, what we do know, we know... We have a good idea of the amount of fuel they're using. We have a good I we have a, a pretty good idea on the general population size. We certainly know what they have contributed to the rest of the world. You know, we know what they're doing and what's coming out of North Korea. Right. And you know, unlike South Korea who uh who among many other things brought out the world's first portable MP3 player, which I have, the MP man, uh, North Korea hasn't done very much at all in terms of trying to help us solve the general problems uh, mm. facing the human condition. But they seem to be making great strides, especially under um, uh, UN, uh, towards a science and technologically uh, rich uh, and diverse future by building science parks, no less. So they all, we already know they have their launch facility for the, their spacefaring ambitions. Uh, and we know that they have a fully functioning uh, airport now. Um, mm-hmm. But apparently there is a a, a little island uh, in their um, their main river, the Taedong River, which they've completely given over to science. And there's a science park on it. And there are lots of photographs floating about on the internet showing you the, all the, the architecture populating these little islands and the, the, the science coast. And they look amazing. These buildings look, you know, really modern looking. It's incredible. And these are photographs we're seeing, it would seem. But then, you know, you check Google Maps and it doesn't quite tally. <laughs> and there's something a bit strange about the photographs. You know, they're kind of Photoshop shoppy looking. Mm. And yet oh, they might, they may be real, but it's so hard to tell because there's so little information. You know, we're really going on a very small amount of information because they're so closed off. And it just amazes me that they can be so closed off. I mean, I, okay, they're in a reasonably remote part of the planet. I mean, you know, they don't, they only have two borders. Uh, but even so, you know, keeping, being so mysterious and, and being able to maintain such secrecy is, is a feat of, engineering it's really amazing and this is probably the main interest in north korea for the rest of the world you know it just really is a mysterious country and everybody would like to know a little bit more about it so uh i think it's absolutely i share that fascinating fascination i think it's uh it would be great to to visit (laughs) if i could yeah they're so closed off and i think they will be closed off until they aren't closed off information is just so proliferating it's inevitable. I think it's already happening in that quite a lot of um quite a lot of North Koreans have mobile phones. And of course there are mobile phone network masts near the border in South Korea. So, you know, you have wireless communications that'll slowly be seeping into the country. And sure, you know, it's it's really going to be a a uh, a project to adequately condition and brainwash the people to resist all of the <laughs> all of the information coming from abroad uh so you know maybe they'll just have to rethink things maybe kim jong un is a a uh, a renovator in that he's going to open it up a little bit more because he has to just like the chinese had to after tiananmen i don't know he's, he's simply going to have to do it and slowly change because if he wants to hold on to power and and stave off any kind of revolution he's simply going to have to change the way he does things or not (laughs) maybe this is again sustainable forever maybe the rest of the world will blow itself up in some huge nuclear conflagration and the only (laughs) the only country that will be unaffected will be north korea who knows i don't know you know what's so crazy it's like in the in the border regions, they're able to pick up um, broadcasts from, like, South Korea, say, for example. And it's so illegal to do that that it's actually... There are instances where um, Kim has this... Uh, these... I don't know what they call them. This, this special Stasi. police force that go knocking... 
Yeah, well, it's, it's worse than the, the Stasi. So these government agents, they go door to door looking for contraband receivers. And if they find, uh, if they find any, or they find evidence that people have been picking up these broadcasts, the punishments can be just so ludicrously severe. Um, you know, there's documented cases of people being killed for, for such transgressions, but, but people do it anyway. Yes. Uh, Again, it's going to happen, and in- instances where that is the case uh, will only increase. And, uh, you know, surely it's going to reach a point where too many people will know the truth, and things will, will have to change. Or there mm. will be some sort of foreign intervention, which which is a possibility, but, but they've always said, and I say they, I mean, you know, they, say that, that North Korea wouldn't be able to pay for an invasion. They They simply aren't going to be invaded because there's nothing there to take. You know, there, there's no booty. No, but it's interesting. Just just in terms of like a um, humanitarian sort of thought experiment on this one, you know, these people are really suffering, but maybe most of them don't realize they're suffering. <laughs> and this is what I mean about, you know, what do you do about this situation? When you're trying to rescue somebody who doesn't want to be rescued. Yeah, we kind of touched on this a few podcasts ago. Um, the example of this extreme faction of the Mormon Church. Uh, several Mormon Church leaders kind of groomed and kidnapped um, X amount of these these young girls. And the American government kind of sent in, sent in the SWAT team to go and rescue them. And basically said, we don't care about your religion. You're being abused. Yeah, so again, this takes us back to moral relativism. You know, we are going to send in the SWAT team because we think the situation is wrong, not because it is in absolutist terms wrong, but we just can't deal with it. You know, you may not be able to handle something, something that's happening next door. You know, they may find, they may think whatever it is they're doing is perfectly normal and they're offended by your intervention. Uh, but you just personally can't deal with it, and you act on your own moral standing. And I think that's surely that's going to have to happen with the rest of the world uh, regarding North Korea. I mean, you know, we'll, we're just going to get more and more information from North Korea to the point where we're we're going to be able to watch executions that are outside live because of the you know, technological advancement of our um, spy satellites. And, uh, you know, we're going to be provoked into doing something. So we're going to have to go in there and, and deal with these people. Now, I'm sure a diplomatic approach will be tried, and I'm, I'm sure that's happening now. But uh, it's difficult when their supreme leader never leaves the country, <laughs> never goes to the, to the negotiating table anywhere. I think he was scheduled to go to Russia, but uh, bailed for some reason. Yeah, so he's never actually gone to talk to any other world leader. Uh, so, you know, they really are closeted off and it's uh, hard to have a conversation when it's one way. So perhaps uh, we're going to have to go to them. And when I say we, it's going to have to be some sort of collaborative, you know, perhaps UN led coalition of some description. Um, but the more we learn about the suffering of the people relative to our own comfort, uh, the more action will be demanded, I think, in the West. But again, we have we have much more we have much more to worry about. Perhaps that has happened. I mean, there has been sort of Western leaders that have Is this Dennis Dennis Rodman. You're talking about yes, Dennis Rodman, and also um, I think Bill Clinton didn't he sort of broker that deal? There was these two American hostages um, that needed to be sort of um, explained out of North Korea. Yeah, there's there used to be a, a frequent. Um, prisoner exchange across Freedom Bridge, uh, which happened uh, quite often, but I think that's quietened down. There's not so much uh, footfall on that bridge any longer for some reason. Right. Okay. Anyway, so I'm just looking at some of the photographs that you've put into the show notes here. So we, we've kind of touched on this, you know, the anti-American propaganda, which is just insane. But, you know, I guess, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing most of these are wartime. So when you have the um, the blonde American sergeant about to shoot this uh, toddler in the head. Um, you know, stuff, everything goes during wartime. Yeah. But a lot of the other stuff isn't. 
you know, it's, it's just a kind of very casual hatred of, of everything American. And they're always portrayed as very ugly caricatures of American. And like this little kid, he's shooting, um, you know, a picture of a GI with <laughs> a gun. But that's what they're fed. I mean, you know, the mythologies have been, are, are taught in the schools. You know, people are, uh, grow up learning about how the Americans were pretty much defeated during the Korean War. Um, and, yeah. uh, you know, there are, there's some captured American vehicles, uh, that, that are in museums that, uh, you can visit and, you know, look, look at what we captured, you know, capturing this one ship means that we had the upper hand during the war and you know, all the rest of it. So there's a huge mythology there and, and, uh, you know, there are rooms filled with, uh, trinkets from world leaders. Uh, given to the Kims and uh, the people are told that the reason why they receive these is because the world recognizes North Korea as the most advanced race and, you know, an envied country and just lies, 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 lies. That's just they're lying to all the people. And again, as information becomes easier to come by, these lies will be exposed. So no matter how distorted or oppressed the the actual thought processes going on in the malnourished brains of the common populace, it's going to get through. And uh, you're going to have a generation of, of people who are, who are going to have to fight in some way. So either it's going to be a mass strike event where, you know, they're just not going to play ball or it's going to be an actual physical attack or, you know, who knows, but, uh, you know, historically there's a boiling point uh, for every you know a, a nation of oppressed people, and, uh, and they'll have a revolution. So, are we going to wait for that? Or, <laughs> or- of course, the the crazy irony um, with some of this is just how much food aid is given to North Korea by by America. Yes, I mean the skeptics would say there are major benefits to American companies giving away food on these programs because they get tax breaks. And- oh, they'd always say stuff like that. And also, you know. You always get the Chomskys out there come out with that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it could be a little bit of that. But also, uh, you know, there is general concern. I mean, there's this, there's bona fide yeah. concern by the rest of the world for these people. I mean, these are people who, who if, from our point of view, are suffering. Yeah, well, this is what I mean about the humanitarian element to this. It's like surely on compassionate grounds, why isn't there some kind of uh, effort in rescuing these people? Yes, why isn't there? I, I'll have to look into it further, but um, I haven't seen much action. I mean, you certainly don't hear much about North. The only thing I ever hear about North Korea is how crazy they all are. I don't really read much about how we need to uh, do something. Of course, we're hearing more and more about North Korea because more and more people are going there. People from the West are going there on holiday, you know, sightseeing, um, slightly, which is a slightly ghoulish thing in my opinion, but there's a, a tour operator Koyo, Ko, 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 Koyo tour, something like that. I can't remember the name. And these tours are very kind of tightly re- res- restricted. You're sort of on rails for the two weeks, which I think is the allotted time that, that you're given. You're not allowed to roam free, and you're you can only visit um, state staged uh, events. Yes, staged. <laughs> state events um but it's you know the stuff that comes back is really interesting but the bizarre thing about that is that they're completely stage managed but the stage managers don't have completely lost touch and have no idea about the rest of the world so it's very easy for a west a sophisticated westerner to go on one of these tours and and see right through it Mm. and see and see reality straight through it and this is this has happened on Many of the filmed tours that uh, that are available on YouTube, you can mm. see the the tourist will ask questions that the tour guides yeah. are are not able to or are not allowed to answer, and they just yes. flatly ignore them as if he didn't. You know, the tourist didn't mention anything or say anything. They they are so either fearful of any kind of response or giveaway that they they literally seem as though they didn't even hear the question. I think I've seen the documentary you're talking about. It's it's this like f- like um video diary of this guy who goes to North Korea in one of these tours and he keeps asking the tour guide certain things and he keeps taking photographs of things that the tour guide keeps telling him off about. It's like no 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 you can't do that. No stop to that. And he got uh, r- really angry with him, but at the end he kind of had a conversation. And he realized that the guy had no choice but to keep telling him to stop doing this stuff or his own you know, fear of 
everything. <laughs> yeah, he's asking about the um, the main concept, the the main concept of philosophy for life in North Korea. This uh, juchi, um yes. idea, which is translated as self reliance, it's the political ideology generally um, imbibed. And uh, this tourist asks one of the tour guides, you know, this self-reliance thing, don't you think, uh, you know, if that's the case, then worshipping the Kim gods is problematic. Wouldn't you prefer to give the people control of their own destinies through some sort of mm. democracy? And yeah. again, they, they simply can't ask, answer those questions. Uh, that's uh, totally against... Uh, uh, not only against the the law, but perhaps outside of their 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 understanding, I mean, they don't even understand the concepts. You know, it's not in their new speak dictionary, so they just simply don't even understand the question. Which again leads us to the conditioning and the brainwashing. Yes. Well, speaking of conditioning and brainwashing, uh, I've mentioned this to you before. Um, it's about this documentary from 2006 by National Geographic, and it's really good. It's about this, or on the face of it, it's about this eye doctor from India who goes on this like humanitarian mission to North Korea to treat you know, X amount of the uh, North Korean peasants who have this relatively simple eye infection or some eye problem. Um, and it's a kind of documentary made by the back door because this documentary crew came along with this guy and on the face of it, you know, t to make a documentary about him. But it was more a documentary about North Korea. And it was just really, 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 really interesting. Um, and just as a bit of a spoiler. Um, so at the end, you have this whole room full of people, uh, North Koreans, who have bandages on their eyes that this eye doctor has treated. And then this is the kind of ceremony where they all take their bandages off and can see for the first time in however many years. Um, and we sort of do this one by one. And every single one of them, as soon as they can recognize that they're seeing, they walk right past the eye doctor and just kneel in front of the two pictures of the Kims. Um, and, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you. And just are all just overjoyed and all this kind of thing. <laughs> and it was the most interesting part of it. Yeah, this. you'd almost want to put on some sort of... Um a uh, CAT scanner or some sort of uh, MRI yes. on their brains and actually see what parts of their brains are lighting up when they do this. Is it the, the part of your brain uh, for lying or is it the, <laughs> the part of your brain for religious belief or, you know, you know, psychologists must have, must have looked at this behavior and said, okay, yeah, I, you can tell because of this cue and this cue and this cue that they're lying. No, but you know, that's interesting because of the, um, the F is a uh, functional F -MRI, MRI where they do to find out whether or not someone's a racist or not. It's like they'll tell you, you know, and they'll actually themselves, you know, say they're not a racist, but their reactions to, you know, questions and how their brain lights up in certain ways will then tell them otherwise. And they're just shocked and horrified. At, Mind reading. So yeah, that'll, Something to look that'll be pretty to. scary for those guys. <laughs> scary for anybody. <laughs> Mind reading. That would be bad news for anyone. Oh. But yeah, healthcare is uh, fairly atrocious. I couldn't find anything good to say about healthcare it's in North free. Korea. It's free. It's free. Yeah, just like everything's free. Um, all the suffering is free as well. Yep. But uh, healthcare is is pretty terrible. Um, but again, T terrible for who? It depends who you're talking about. T terrible, terrible relative to the West, I suppose. Yeah, but that documentary about the defectors. Now, I, it must have been for show, but you kind of saw him, you know, going about his daily life, this American guy who lives in North Korea, and you sort of, we follow him and to see his doctor, and it seemed like a normal doctor who was examining him and telling him, you know, what seemed like legitimate advice about his health and all this other stuff, and that's almost certainly partly for the benefit of the cameras and the people in the West. So I think people in Pyongyang probably have reasonably decent health care. Yeah, maybe. Again, it could be a whole city of elites. Um, yes. well, I think it's exactly that. It, it's hard to know, but definitely the sense of fear. I mean, if you imagine yourself to live in North Korea, knowing that you have no access to the outside world and knowing that there's no democracy and knowing the shortage of resources, that's, that's fear times three already. So yes. there's significant fear, especially when you have the threat that if you... 
exhibited anything that could be interpreted as treason. Not only you, but members of your family, uh, you know, intergenerate, pan generationally may suffer the consequences. You know, Indeed. not just you, but your whole family will go to a, a labor camp or, you know, so there's, there's big risks. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of reasons why you should consider the Kims to be religious because you never know. They might be. So hedge your bets and, uh, worship at their altar. But, um, yeah, so starvation certainly does happen, uh, as we both mentioned. Uh, that is a real problem. Food is a problem. You know, food is difficult to manufacture, especially when you don't have very much oil, which most – ever since um, the Green Revolution, you know, so oil is incredibly important in food production. And, um, and, and they're starving. Uh, the chap who was uh, – who told his story in that book, Escape from Camp 14 – when asked, what's the most startling thing about the West that you've seen so far? You know, what, what, what amazes you? And uh, you're thinking that he might say something about the technology or the, what people are wearing or the buildings and, you know, that sort of thing. But what he said was the wasted food. This, hmm. he couldn't believe that people were literally throwing away food into garbage right. cans. You know, he said food is, <laughs> You will turn your your family in. You will kill your own family, you know, in order to to, to eat, because mm. you know there's only so much grass you can eat before you're starving. Because you know there's mm -hmm. <laughs> there's no calorific value in vegetables and uh, rats and whatever they could possibly get. Uh, mm. Certainly in the prison camps was uh, you know it's all about you're starving, and when you're starving, your thought processes are radically different from when you are fed. Uh, so he goes into, you know, what it's like to be starving all the time. And that changes the way you think, you know, you turn a human, you dehumanize people. If you're starving all the time, you're not dealing with humans anymore. And this, this was discovered when, you know, they liberated the, the death camps in Nazi Germany. And these people were so, so starving. Uh, they, they were so on the edge of life through starvation that you couldn't even feed them because you'd kill them. <laughs> it was a, yeah, you have to be very gentle. Yeah, that. diabolical situation. Plumpy nut. Yes, plumpy nut. They should. Uh, <laughs> they should definitely. Uh, I mean, they send lots of things over the border. I mean, the yeah. the South send a lot of agit prop and you know balloons with messages and all the rest over the yeah. fences. And I'm sure food is floating. And over. Um, they they sent over like a drone or maybe it was a balloon full of a whole bunch of DVDs of the interview. So. They were probably saying, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, they had to get rid of that film any somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, of course, you've got a country where everyone is, not everyone, but a country where a lot of people are starving. And uh, Kim Jong-un is so fat. Yes. And I can imagine, you know, that's everybody. This is the level of our discussion. Every, everybody looks up to that. You know, the, the chubbier you are, obviously, the more important you are. No, we're not talking about, you know, England and the... 17th century or whatever uh, it's a status uh, well i mean you know that's true of lots of countries especially in africa but um these days these oh, days absolutely is. yeah but uh he he is well known for massive excesses on um, luxury items oh, just like sure. his dad so, same his with his dad, dad yeah, and his so, grandfather actually maybe not so much his grandfather i think his his grandfather is um some of the respect uh, that he was awarded seems sort of earned in some ways. Obviously, they made up a whole bunch of crap about, I mean, really proper crap. I think he was miraculously conceived. Yeah, but he wasn't as much of a total scumbag as his son and grandson. Yeah, but perhaps there's simply less information on him. Yeah, I think there is. Um, but also, I just kind of, we're obviously sort of coming to the end here, but there's a little bit of positivity, which I didn't even realize. But, um, a lot of people in North Korea, they get their food from these little markets that they have. I've forgotten the name of them, but they're these special little little market markets where they get their produce and things like that. Obviously, in places like Pyongyang, there are department stores. But a lot of, apparently, a, a lot of times, department stores, the, the stuff there is just not for sale. <laughs> it's, just, it's just for effect. Visual placebos. Um, so they, they have all these markets, but they were outlawed not that long ago. And there was public protests, and the ban was lifted in North Korea. Doesn't that sound crazy? Well, that's like altering the wheat prices in um, in uh, Syria. You know, there there's certain things that if you mess with, there are consequences, even in a completely oppressive state. 
<clears throat> that's the situation here. But I think that's sort of progress of a kind. Yeah, and there's certainly progress on building. I mean, there's the famous Hotel of Doom, the Rug Yong Hotel, which has languished uh, in, the, in the late 80s. But then suddenly, you know, relatively recently, they've, they've completed the project. And it's, an, it's, it's, it's still not open. A gigantic building. I mean, it is vast. This building's incredible. And there are other, you know, there are monuments like the, 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 um, Juchi monument, which is exactly the same height as the Washington Memorial, right. which is huge. And there are lots of other building projects. So, you know, clearly they have resources and, uh, they have a, a labor, um, uh, resource. Uh, you know, they're, they're clearly not importing labor like Saudi Arabia. Yes. You know, this is, they are building these buildings themselves. Although, although I'm not sure if that's entirely true because that, that big, uh, Ryung, Ryung Rug, Yong Hotel. Yeah, Rug Yong. The reason why that whole system was restarted, obviously, when the whole arduous march thing happened, they had to uh, they had to freeze that. But I think it was Chinese contractors that came in and uh, did all the repair work and got that up and running. It was certainly a Chinese company that injected all the cash to get it finished. Yes, yeah, there's definitely Chinese investment there. Um, so. What a peculiar country. I just feel yeah. like we just simply don't know that much about it. And and what we do know about it is alarming and... Sketchy. Sketchy, uh, but certainly thought-provoking. So I'll continue. I mean, I've, I've been very impressed by the, uh, the, the documentaries that are available on YouTube and other places. And there are a few good books uh, on North Korea about the defections and, um, you know, accounts of uh of how it all works and there has been some travel abroad by uh you know th there's music uh you know the, the performers have traveled uh to china uh, to perform so you know maybe they are opening up and you know, maybe it's not a, not all doom and gloom but i uh, think it is all doom and gloom i mean do you remember maybe it was the last world cup i'm not sure where north korea actually made it that far and so North Korea were playing in whatever the host country was. It might have been South Africa. I'm not sure. I, I, don't, I don't recall. Yeah. And so I don't know how many games they played, but there were a lot of, uh, you know, North Koreans there, you know, cheering their team. But they actually weren't North Koreans because uh, North Koreans weren't allowed to leave their country. I think they were all Chinese um, supporters who were there on North Korea's behalf. So, yeah, that's pretty crazy. I mean, the Kims didn't want a bunch of North Koreans going over to the West to be corrupted. Terrible. Well, when I was at the uh, the 2012 Olympics on Super Saturday, I was sitting directly under the North uh, <laughs> the North Korean flag, and I was fully prepared to cheer for them, uh, but right. alas, uh, I didn't see them. Right. Okay. But, you know, they are out there. D just one last thing. I see you've got a photograph of the um, the embassy in London. <laughs> yes. I discovered that that was the embassy, uh, was it last year or this year, when there were some barbers in London, they said, like, bad hair day, you know, get mm -hmm. your hair cut here, and they had a big photograph of uh, the youngest, Kim, and the, uh, <laughs> the, um, some ambassadors from the embassy came over and uh, ordered him to take it down, he just <laughs> didn't. That's funny. I've been there in Gunnersby, and I've I've seen that. Um, I didn't believe it, but the flag was up, so I guess oh, I really? had to believe it. Yeah, there's a flagpole outside, and I saw the oh. flag, and I went, I, I guess it must be. But it's a, a fairly nice suburban semi, <laughs> yeah, it looks 1930s. Nice. Yeah, it's lovely. But uh, I think we've covered all that we know about North Korea, and uh, I think there's a heck of a lot more that can be learned. But, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll learn from the media the next time they launch some test missiles into the uh, Sea of Japan. Or, or whether or not uh, Kim Jong-un actually makes it out of his country to visit a foreign leader. I think we covered a lot of what we don't know as well. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Well, our, uh, our, we haven't uh, decided on what the next show is going to be, but it you could sure? well be Dame Judy Dench. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll make a decision and we'll put that information on our website, hey, which why is... Why don't we make that decision now? Yeah, let's not. Um, eclecticist.co.uk, where you can find out more information about all of our previous shows. You can find uh, information on our forthcoming shows, which could uh, be about Dame Judy Dench. You never know. Also, if you'd like to leave some feedback, there's a little form at the very bottom, and all of our show notes are available as well. Our outro music of choice this time is entitled Leader Kim Jong-il Will Show the Way to Victory. 
It's by a band called Wang Jaesan Light Music Band. This is a North Korean band that toured. Uh, they were allegedly all executed. There is a, a real purge on art, and a couple of bands were all killed. But this could well be just complete lies by um, the South Korean press, uh, most notably Chosen Ilbo. Uh, where they have an article called Kim Jong-un's ex-girlfriend shot by firing squad and uh, she was a member of one of the bands and they're all killed. It's probably not true, but their music is very interesting, quite sort of dated to our ears, but, but quite electronic and very interesting. It's, it's very peculiar music, but uh, have a listen and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, thank you very much for listening and good evening. <laughs>